welcome to the Center for the Study of Economy and Society's Spring Term Colloquium Series in Economic Sociology. And it's my, oh, also I see prospective students uh, in the audience, welcome to this colloquium. And I'm Victor Nee, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Paul DeMarcio to this Cornell audience. Uh, Paul is professor of sociology at NYU University and a much loved, distinguished professor of emeritus at Princeton. Uh, together with the Powell, Paul is the intellectual leader of neo institutional organizational sociology, which has evolved with many people contributing to it as the most influential paradigm in organizational research. Uh, Paul has also contributed to advancing economic sociology, evident in a convergence uh, between organizational and economic sociology, especially uh, evident in business schools. His work in studying social inequality on the internet and network effects in collaboration with Felice Garib have been broad and has had growing influence. In this, and his contribution to cultural sociology uh, underscores Paul's disciplinary wide intellectual influence and reach. Paul is presenting today through Zoom. There was an initial optimism on my part that uh, was not shared by Paul, that he would be able to visit the Cornell campus as he regularly has done in the past. But we have him on Zoom and therefore we also have a broader audience uh, on account of Zoom. Paul has been an active member of CSCS intellectual community. He is a founding member of our external board and fellow of the center. Uh, Paul has participated in almost all of our conferences and symposium, and he has contributed regularly to our colloquium series and seminar series with great generosity of spirit. Um, in very much in the tradition and embodiment of the vision of the University Without Walls, which was articulated by the late Robert K. Merton, uh, who also was a founding external board member of the center. Um, one aspect of introducing Paul DiMaggio to a Cornell audience is that I can keep my remarks brief. Uh, since Paul's work is not only familiar to us, but his many articles and books have actually influenced our work here at Cornell. The title of Paul's seminar today is When Content is King, Using Topic, topic Models to Analyze Online Innovation Crowdsourcing at IBM. I see we have an Indian international audience. There's uh, Siggy Lindenberg in the audience too from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, and one aspect that we are going to do with the center is to uh, very much reach out to be more expansive in our intellectual community, reaching out to all the fellows, the external board members, and people who have participated uh, in the CSES community presenting their work. So we will be uh, trying our best to expand our, uh, the reach of the speakers who are generous to present their talks with us here at Cornell. Okay, Paul. Well, thank you, Victor, for that very kind and very generous um, introduction. It's always a pleasure to um, to be with you, the center is really um, the signal center for the study of economic sociology and economy and society. And um, I, I 
always enjoy the seminars and always enjoy participating in them myself. I wish that I could be with you today in Cornell and see the spring in Ithaca, which is always a delight. But um, I'm glad to see some some friends and colleagues who would not have been able to attend in person. So we'll we'll um, take the good with the bad. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and try to make that happen. Um, and then I'm going to try to get the pictures of everybody in the corner and not in the middle of my slides. Okay, good. So can you all see uh, the slides? Yes. Um, okay, so um, this is a project that sort of came out of nowhere. I, I was talking one day to my friend Charles Heckscher, who's a sociologist on the faculty at, at Rutgers in their School of Industrial Relations, who mentioned that he had been doing work at IBM and mostly kind of field work, looking at organizational change and the transformation of that company, gosh, around um, quite a long time ago. And that the, the folks there said, would you like to see you know, the text files for this online discussion that we had had? We're calling it a jam. and. It involved a lot of people in the company and it was pretty interesting. And he said, sure. And, uh, you know, many years later, he said, you know, I have these files, but I'm trying to figure out what to do with them. And he knew that I was beginning to do some work with topic modeling. And he said, would you like to collaborate? And I said, sure. And then time passed and we finally got around to doing it. So there's Charles, who's also a co-author on the paper that I'm talking about today. We also um, brought in two other people. One, David Mimno on the right will be familiar to um, all of you at Cornell. And, and David really got us started with the um, beating the data into shape and figuring out how to approach them with topic models. And Clark Bernier to the left of David is a co-author on, on this paper um, and did most of the analyses as well as um, being a partner in the thinking. Um, so the first paper that came out of this data set was for a, a festschrift for Randall Collins and looked at whether interaction ritual theory applied online. We found that it pretty much did, that consistent with the theory, shared focus and entrainment kept discussions going um, and led to a persistence and lengthening of threads. But then we discovered something interesting about the, the data for um, the second of the two online discussions that we were given. And that's that they selected a certain number of, um, of texts, a certain number of posts to exemplify good ideas. So we got interested in what was it about the uh, posts that were selected. And that's what today's talk is about. Um, in 2004, IBM sponsored a 54-hour conversation for IBM employees. It was global in scope. And the idea was to brainstorm solutions to global challenges, building on a discussion the year before, out of which came a new set of values, a new mission statement. So the question is, out of 31,000 posts, actually more than that, by almost 13,000 IBM employees, what predicts the 273 that were selected to illustrate promising ideas that IBM's uh, communication team uh, cho chose to de for development and then parts of IBM selected some of them for actual development. And then in particular, how did the content of the posts shape the probability that they would be selected? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the innovation crowdsourcing and the literature and why we're looking at content, introduce the case, talk about the analyses and then share the results. So innovation crowdsourcing is really about as old as the internet's um, becoming a, a major thing, in particular corporate intranets. Um, I guess it, it, it pretty much um, coincides with Internet 2.0 um, or Web 2.0. And, and it's when companies or other entities use crowdsourcing to tie, try to generate uh, good ideas or solutions to problems. Um, there are two dimensions on which these otherwise quite you know, diverse events vary. Some of them are around specific challenges, like we're looking for a design of a great new battery that will last twice as long as the old ones, versus having very broad mandates. We're looking for good ideas that can be implemented um, in a range of ways. The other dimension is whether the boundaries are open, whether it's for anybody in the world to participate in, or whether they're closed, whether they're limited to um, 
employees of a particular organization or maybe organization and its partners or customers. And we're focusing um, today, and everything I'm, I'm talking about today is related to this quadrant, broad mandate and organizational boundary. So within a particular organization. There, the idea of, um, so IBM dubbed these kind of company-wide discussions a jams. They're trying to get at the sort of improvisatory character of, of jazz and making an analogy to that, the idea that people would speak freely and, and be willing to push the envelope on ideas. Jams are company-wide. They're broadly focused. They've been adopted by many companies, Volvo, Nokia, Lilly, among others. Um, as a matter of fact, so many companies that IBM has a small business where they'll actually manage um, jams for other companies using the expertise that they've developed over 20 years now and, and probably, a, probably a few dozen of these things internally. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a, something which has spread quite a bit. I, I think there are three functions that these things serve. One is that they tend to reinforce company-wide values and culture. They're a communications device. They can also rewire communications networks to get away from some of the provincialism which can stand in the way of organizational change. And they're also a way to address obdurate problems to, to get more thinking about company-wide problems. There's a huge literature on this, which I discovered. I actually didn't ex expect to find it and it took me a while to find it, but once I did, it just kept growing and growing. The 2019 review found 278 papers that were studies of this phenomenon, crowdsourced innovation of different kinds. And the reason they were hard to find is not many of them were in sociology and not even that many were in organizational behavior journals. They're in places like innovation management, marketing journals, strategy journals, information science journals, kind of all over the place. Did we lose Paul? Paul? Uh, well, we have had some, are having some technical problems. I think it's on. Uh oh. Huh. Well, let's hope. It why don't we wait? Uh, Please stand by for a brief intermission. Yes, yes. Uh, well, we can uh, welcome again the prospective students in the audience. Uh, and we're pleased that you're visiting uh, us through Zoom. And under normal times, many of them of you would have come to the Cornell campus. Uh, Let's see, uh, and uh, welcome to Peter Katzenstein from the government department uh, and, I, and, and the others here. Uh, I wonder what's going, uh, again, and uh, Kim Whedon, I see is in the audience, welcome. And, but quite a few uh, prospective students. Uh, so while we wait, uh, feel free to ask us about uh, Cornell University, and and then we'll hope that Paul's going to do, get his internet restored, uh, Wi-Fi restored. Michael, good to see you in Canada. Hello. Nice to see you, Victor. And Diane oh. Burton, nice to see While you. While we're waiting for Paul, I. Just quickly mention that I uh, also did a study of IBM uh, communications. Um, quickly, in two sentence summary, we found support for Huntington's clash of civilizations hypothesis in the company at large. That is to say, membership in a culture would predict the, for the formation of friendship ties between people. But when we looked at work groups within IBM, we found the opposite, that with, within a work group, organized around a task, people actually preferred to have social ties with people across cultural boundaries. 
Well, I think that's good. Similar data set, not exactly the same one, but uh, it was from IBM's uh, internal, they have their own internal Facebook, if you will. So Michael, why, Michael, why do you think that uh, hunting can be scaled down to IBM or other organizations? Does culture mean the same thing? Yeah, uh, we, we also tested it with, in another paper, we used uh, all of uh, Twitter um, to, to run the same test on a glo more global scale than IBM, IBM being just a single company. Um, and um, yeah, we found some, we found evidence for this in global global communications as well. Um, but, but do you think that civilizations are the same thing as organizational culture? No, definitely not the same as organizational culture. In fact, in a way, that's what we're finding that we, when we look within work groups, we found a very different pattern than we found uh, outside work or across work groups. And so the organizational mechanism was really uh, extremely important. In fact, that's, I think, decisive. Whether, what, what the, the definition of culture, I'll leave that to people that are smarter than I am, but we simply operationalized it. So it's, it's uh, we, we operationalized it using Huntington's uh, schema. Right, it's just that Huntington, you know, when you look at his chart, China is red, you know, and the yeah. Middle East is green. There's no internal variability. That's right. It stipulates a unity which you are not taking for granted. So we were testing whether that had right. any explanatory power. Right. And so we tested within and between. All right, All right. Well, lots of tests have been run on hunting and on the whole, they don't work too well, so. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, I think that for ours as well, it's mixed results. Yeah. Alice, would you mind uh, checking in with uh, Paul to see what uh, how what's the problem? Yes, I'll. I got an email sent to him. Oh, you have good. I was just going to write one myself, but since you've sent it, uh, that should be fine. But it occurred to me that Paul. Uh, might be in Maine, where the internet is not so reliable. He has a second home in Maine, and now we can uh, uh, all teach online, and that doesn't mean you have to stay in New York City. Uh, uh, that, uh, but while we ha are waiting for Paul to get back online, uh, I would like to uh, ask Michael uh, to uh, join me in discussing a paper that is related to what Paul is talking about uh, across crowdsourcing innovation, related in the sense that Michael and I have been collaborating together on research uh, on knowledge spillover, which was an idea that uh, was introduced to, to economics by Alfred Marshall as one of the three causal mechanisms of increasing returns to geographical uh, location uh, of uh, regional knowledge economies. And he identified knowledge spillover as a key, uh, which is uh, to innovation. Uh, and then Krugman uh, studied it, uh, questioned and said, the heck with that, we're not gonna deal with knowledge spillover, we'll just deal with what we can measure, human capital and non-tradable inputs and leave knowledge spill over to the sociologists because they like to wave their hands <laughs> because knowledge flows are invisible. So we actually figured out a way to measure knowledge spill over uh, in real time behaviorally uh, using big data from the internet. Uh, and we have a paper, two papers in, uh, under review now. And one uh, in particular about uh, topic novelty Michael, uh, would you be willing to pick up on this and we can continue the discussion by way we wait for Paul? Sure, yeah, yeah. so the, uh, one of the papers is on um, <coughs> specialization um, and, um, and the other is on knowledge spillover. Um, and in some ways there, each one is the flip side of the other. Um, 
the knowledge spillover is based on a bipartite graph of. Oh, there's Paul. <laughs> Go ahead, finish your sentence, uh, but it was good to see Paul. Yes. Uh, well, we. Well, I'll finish it after. Let, let's let's get Paul back on while. Long's here. Uh, let's see. Is Paul? I don't see Paul. Uh, I see him. Uh, he's just. On he's the on mute. You. No, I'm unmuted oh. now. Ah. I'm very sorry about that. You know, in, for the entire pandemic, our internet has never gone out here, but it just went out. And I had to unplug it and restart it again. Um, and now it's it's working. We have Verizon, which usually is relatively, oh shit. Um, oh dear. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. It, it's something is behaving strangely here, but let's hope that we can we can go on. Um, and I apologize for that. Um, Glad you're back. On behalf of the whole Verizon family, <laughs> um, of which I'm an unwilling part. Um, okay. So, so anyway, the, the the point I was I was making when we were interrupted was that. Um, not very few papers have, have used measures of content, and that's what we're doing with this. So we're, we're asking these questions. How does the post's content influence the probability that will be selected as representing one of these big ideas? To what extent does the alignment of a post's subject matter with the emphases of organizational elites influence its chances of being selected? To what extent does the alignment with peer evaluation, how important peers think that a topic is influence its chance of selection. Of course, the idea of peer evaluation and peer opinion Im implies that there's agreement or consensus throughout the firm on what matters. So that's another empirical question that we're addressing. We're also asking something which has been alleged frequently in discussion in commentary on online discussions of this sort. Um, but to my knowledge, it has not been... Um, did I lose you again, or hello? I don't know, we hear you. Oh, uh, good. Okay, I heard uh, something strange. Yeah, but we don't see the this, this slides. Oh no. Okay. Um, well, let's let's go back with to, into sharing screen. I thought I'm I'm seeing a I'm not seeing you all. I'm seeing a okay. Um. But it's all right if we can't see the slides, you're making perfect sense. Well, but I may stop making sense, in which case the slides could be useful. Okay, can you, can you see it now? Yeah. Good. Um, okay. And, okay, so in, in the, um, so we're looking at the deliberation, which hasn't empirically, which I don't know if it's been done before in quite this way. And then finally, how do substantive topics interact? Um, what's the role of novelty in, in influencing all this? Okay. Um, so why are we looking at content? Obviously, some subjects are more important than other subjects. It's kind of a boring and obvious observation, but um, it's important for model specification. If you're not controlling for something which is driving results, you're liable to make um, you know, inferences that are incorrect. Um, the second is that attention is a scarce resource. So the allocation of attention to topics gives you a sense of what organization members regard as important. So it's a, it's a useful qualitative tool. Um, jams have the function of sending information upwards. They allow executives and managers to figure out what people consider important and are worried about in, the, in an organization. It's kind of a reality test for executives. And they also send um, information downward about organizational culture, about what executives are, are believe is important. And they align definitions of the situation across levels, or at least they potentially do that. So a little bit about the case. IBM um, in 1991, um, uh, in 1990, was facing a, a major crisis. People who were around at the time referred to it as a near-death experience. 
Um, and um, they brought an outside leadership to the company for the first time, um, changed their business model. They basically discarded the corporate culture, which had been defining at IBM for decades, laid off a whole lot of people. Then as the company recovered, they brought in a lot of new people. Um, so the large proportion of the people who were working at IBM by the late 90s, early 2000s, didn't have experience with the firm as it had been. Uh, once um, Lou Gerstner, who had been brought in to sort of turn the company around, declared victory and left, they brought in a, a new CEO, Sam Palmasano, who came out of marketing and sales, which was the traditional source of leadership at IBM. And, and he was in line with the new changes, but he also thought it was important to create a new organizational culture and to develop collective purpose, which was, was lacking in the company that was still a bit shell-shocked from rapid change. 2003, they had something called the Values Jam. Uh, Palmasano and a team put together a new kind of corporate mission statement or value statement. And there was a discussion of it online. It was quite contentious. There were a lot of, um, a lot of anger from old employees, but they, um, it, it went on and they came out with a new set of values. And in 2004, they initiated the World Jam, the discussion that uh, we're studying um, in order to take the values and translate them into action, into innovative programs. If you look at the transition based from the values jam to the, uh, the old values to the new values, it's a shift from sort of old blue, big blue to a culture of collaboration and innovation. So each of the old values, the Tom, Thomas Watson Jr. basic beliefs, which reigned for 40 years, it was had a kind of counterpart in the new values that came out of the values jam, um, but they were inflected in different ways. So respect for the individual became trust and responsibility in all relationships, no longer just the individual, an emphasis on relationships. Similarly, go the last mile for the customer turned into dedication to every client's success, a shift from customers to clients, from transactions to long-term relationships. And then aim for excellent performance, very present focused innovation that matters, the sense that innovation was an important part of the company's um, success. This is what um, employees saw when they logged into the World Jam. There were six forums. Each of them was around one of these three new values. Client success had making IBM work for each client and then delivery excellence. Innovation that matters for the world and for our company and then trust and personal responsibility, the role of the manager, and then um, for, for other people as well. There were also some other features, but most of the activity was in the forums um, and involved thread discussion threads within each forum. People would navigate to the forum in which they wanted to participate and then um, go on. The, the jam was public and it was open to any IBM employee. There wasn't any censorship and this was important. That had been a big issue with the values jam when there was a lot of rancor and a lot of, um, a lot of disagreement. There had even been some in the company who wanted to shut it down at that time, but they were convinced not to. And that was probably very important for the success of the, um, of the world jam, which had a lot more people participating and, and um, I, I think the other thing which we found out and Charles interviewed people in the, who were trying to start a union in the company employees association who confirmed that there were no reprisals based on what people um, did in the jam in 2003. So that also I think made people more open to participating in 2004. Uh, people could lurk, you didn't have to actually post as long as you registered, you could just read all of the other posts. The, um, the jam competed with other things that people were doing with their daily responsibilities. And um, that was important. It, it um, meant that participation was episodic. You didn't have people sitting and spending a whole day just interacting back and forth. They would, they would you know, phase in and out. First line managers were told by um, Palmasano to have pre-jam discussions that both highlighted the importance of the jam, that it mattered to management, and also was meant to prime employees to participate. There was a collaborative kind of framing. There wasn't a contest framing. There were no prizes. Um, and as a matter of fact, the things that were chosen were chosen to represent or to exemplify ideas that were constructed by the people who, who 
vetted and, and looked over all of the posts rather than being um, being selected as as the actual ideas that were going to be um, explored. So the payoff to individuals wasn't that high. There was a lot of incentive to collaborate and work together, not a lot of incentive to try to be the winner because there really weren't winners. Selection process um, involved looking at 31,000 posts from the six forums, executives and staff from communications did the um, reviewing. There were three all day meetings that began the process and then they broke into teams for each forum. And they, everybody in each team read every post, about 3,000 to 6,000 per team, having read 5,000 of these or so myself, I can say that that's a, you know, it takes a while and was a pretty big deal. And then they would discuss the key themes that they thought had come out of these posts and identify ideas that had to be actionable, they had to be practical, and were also new enough to, to be considered innovative. And then for each of these ideas that they um, identified, so this was an active process of idea and proposal construction by the communication staff, um, they would select one to two posts that exemplified those ideas. So they, they ultimately selected 273 posts that represented 191 um, ideas or proposals. So our data are all of the posts, the text, full text, um, and they're tagged with the location of the poster, um, a, a very uh, unrefined uh, category of job type, executive manager or other, other being mostly technical sales and so on, um, and gender, and the posts were assembled in, or we assembled the posts into 13,000 threads. Um, and of course, we have the dependent variables, which is which ones were selected. We talked with, um, interviewed a number of IBM executives who were involved in designing the jam, and, and that was very useful. And we read about 5,000 of the posts, first to validate the topic model, but then we, we kind of got into it and became interested in the ideas that animated the discussion. Probably, you know, talking, it's, I don't have to say too much about topic models here because um, I suspect that you're all familiar with them. Um, we used a structural topic model with 30 topics of which 29 were substantively interesting. So we ended up focusing on the 29. Um, we reviewed the top terms um, for each model and we reviewed representative posts to um, kind of confirm our interpretations or change our interpretations. And we developed uh, measures of content that were based on the position of each post in the space produced by these 29 topics. So we uh, measured the topical content of the post, the extent to which they were aligned with posts by elites that started off the process and the extent to which they were aligned with the kind of peer um, emphases. Independent variables uh, were um, most important probably were, were binary variables representing the prevalence in a given post of 29 different substantive topics um, it had to be they had to account for 10 percent or more of the um, of the the words in the post that were assigned uh, but it was robust from about six percent to about 18 percent and there were, weren't many cases above 18 percent we measured elite alignment by whether the post represented at, at 0.10 or, or more um, at least one topic that was highly represented in a series of posts that forum moderators used to kick off the discussion. Forum moderators were executives drawn in from different parts of the globe, high level IBM um, executives and managers uh, whose work was relevant to the theme of a given forum. And then we did additional analyses, the, the, not, not outside of the sort of logistic regression framework, looking at, at peer alignment and consensus, elite alignment and the effects of deliberation and combinatorial diversity. Um, controlled for executives and managers, for gender, for uh, what continent the post came from, how long the post was, where it occurred in the jam, you know, in terms of the sequence of, of um, of periods of the jam. And then at the level of threads, we looked at generativity, the, uh, whether a post received a response or not, and how many subsequent posts were in the thread. 
And we looked at the position of the post in the thread sequence, how much deliberation had occurred by the time we got to that point in the thread, and then a couple of other um, variables which were needed for control, but turned out to not be that important. So what did we find? Um, first thing is that substance mattered. Um, different topics uh, were, <coughs> excuse me, had differential association with um, selection. Um, topic measures also mediated the effects of the position of the poster and the location. Um, in some cases, those became insignificant once the dummies for the topics were entered. So, um, it, it, you know, it, including the topic measures was important for interpreting the other effects of other variables. But we can also learn a lot by looking at what topics promoted or deterred selection. We can learn a lot qualitatively about the process at the time. So certain topics were over-selected. For example, control versus flexibility and the key terms, leading terms are, are under the, uh, the red. Um, these were posts that had to do with how do you maintain necessary budgetary and managerial control over operations, but at the same time, let uh, kind of ground level staff uh, do what they need to do quickly and flexibly in order to take advantage of business opportunities. Career development was a theme which increased the probability that a post would be selected, and that had to do with how, how do you increase the human capital of people who are working at IBM and give them opportunities to develop careers within the firm. And then the third um, topic, which was associated with um, increasing the probability of selection to a high degree, was aligning incentives. Um, Basically, how do you get around silos? There were a lot of incentives for people to meet. Um, a lot of measurement took place within departments, not as much in ways that would actually um, promote or reward mentoring, that would promote or reward helping someone in another department make a sale or, or, or produce something valuable. So that was uh, that's kind of an evergreen topic that pops up in, in a lot of jams at IBM and, of course, other companies as well. There were also topics that tended to deter selection. Um, a couple of them were ones that resonated more with the two, 2003 values jam, discussion of personal values, respect, trust, personal responsibility. In a sense, going over issues that had been the theme of the, the values jam. Um, posts about work-family balance, about problems that people had in, in balancing work in, in the firm that, that um, expressed grievances about pay or loyalty and things like that, particularly post by longtime IBMers who were, were um, decrying change in the company also were underselected. Um, and then there were a number of people, the same with, with time and work life post, which were kind of similar. Um, people complaining about not being able to take vacations, um, how they counted their hours and so on. Kind of, um, yeah. And then finally, there were some really wonky posts, not a lot of them that basically had to do with software, Linux and things like that, that, that didn't really generate proposals, um, but were more tech, techies kind of talking with one another. Second thing that we found was that aligning with the um, thematic emphases of elites mattered. And when I talk about alignment, I don't mean that people agreed substantively with um, the moderators or with anybody else. There was a lot of discussion, but that they emphasized the same themes, the same topics were prominent. And it turns out that the posts that represented a topic that appeared in the forum moderators kickoff posts were more than twice as likely to be selected. And that's controlling for everything, including the topics themselves. Then it's important, I think, to note that the forum moderators were not involved in the selection process. It was the selection process was handled by the communications department and the forum moderators were outside of that. Peer alignment mattered. Um, basically, there was, you can predict um, the themes in the selected posts by looking at the prevalence of the same themes in the uh, in the discussion as a whole. R squared was 0.8 and it was even higher at the level of forums between 0.83 and 0.97, with one exception. Now, there's also a fair amount of consensus, a lot of agreement 
among executives, managers, and others on what topics were important, what topics were worth talking about. So, you know, we see with the, with one exception down here in Forum Four, um, we see correlations of 0.93 to 0.99 in um, the emphases of the topics that people in different groups um, included in their posts. Same thing when we look at correlations among posts from different areas of the globe. Again, very high level of consensus on what issues mattered, not necessarily what to do with them, but on, um, on what was worth talking about. At the same time, we found a lot of differentiation among the forums that were devoted to different core values. So the pairs of forums uh, that were devoted to different core values. So, you know, a lot of correlation between um, the two forums that, that were involved with the first value and then quite a bit with the forums that um, were involved with the third, less with uh, the third and the fourth. But then if you look at correlations among in, in what people were talking about among forums devoted to different values, they were much lower, as low as 0.155 or whatever, as opposed to in the 0.866. Um, so one of the most interesting things that we found and in part interesting because it's kind of hard to study this, is that there's some evidence that deliberation not only increases selection rates, but also generated a kind of reframing of discussions. Um, it turns out that the longer the thread, the higher the probability that a text would be selected. So a text that occurred in the fifth generation of a thread was considerably more likely to be selected than one that kicked it off or one that occurred kind of in the second in the second round. Um, <clears throat> in other words, some evidence that by the criteria that were used by the selectors, the quality of, of posts improved over the course of a discussion. But what's even more interesting, I think, is that this was even more true of posts that were not aligned with the moderator's emphases than it was of posts that were. These are the posts that were aligned with what the moderators thought was important. And, and it does increase as with every generation. They're more likely to be, they're more likely to be um, selected. But um, of the posts that didn't agree, they, they go up even more sharply. And what we see is that by the fifth or sixth iteration of a thread, um, posts that don't align with the initial emphases are actually more likely to be selected than those that do in contrast to earlier in the thread. So it seems like there may have been a, a productive reframing of some of these discussions over the course of, uh, the, over the, course of the threads. Finally, we looked at combinatorial diversity. Um, theory tells us that innovation often occurs when you have cross-fertilization of different frames, ideas, ways of thinking, different perspectives. That's kind of a something which a lot of the organizational behavior literature emphasizes. So we think that there's an important distinction that has been missing from this literature between two different kinds of combinatorial diversity. Things can be combined that are diverse because you rarely see them together. They rarely are found in the same um, environment where they can be combined in a diverse way because the things that are being combined are intrinsically very different from one another. I think that difference has been elided in much of the literature, but it, that it's, it's potentially important. So what is it, what do I mean by that? You can combine on dissimilarity and combine things that are very different. This is Clark, the co-author, um, with a dog. It's his dog. Um, dogs are really different than people, but you often find them together. So they're very dissimilar, but they're not, it's not all that unusual to see them together. The mechanism when you combine on dissimilarity, we would argue, is that you get this kind of defamiliarizing juxtaposition of two things that are very different, which can create new cognitive frameworks. It can jog people out of conventional ways of thinking. To uh, look at this, we computed the distance between topics based on term vectors, the Euclidean distance between the, the vectors of terms um, in the topics. 
And then at the level of the post, we measured combinatorial diversity by the weighted distance between each pair of topics that was highly represented within the post, um, weighted by their, their proportion of, of terms. In posts where there was only one topic that was strongly represented, the semantic diversity was zero. Okay, so that's, that's combining on the intrinsic dissimilarity of the, of the topics. You can also combine on how unusual it is for things to appear together. Here's some, uh, someone with a chimpanzee. Chimpanzees are genetically very similar to people, unlike dogs, but you very rarely find them in the same household. In this case, um, you have separateness rather than dissimilarity as being the major kind of difference. And the mechanism here we would argue is integrating complementary experience and expertise across silos. You may have two groups that are using um, not even that different language to talk about not that different issues, but don't interact very much. And if you bring them together, um, you may get a kind of productive integration. For this, we computed the jacquard distance between topics based on the frequency with which they co-occur. So this is a measure of co-occurrence. It doesn't have anything to do with the terms that are in the topics. And the spatial combinatorial diversity of a post is based on the weighted distance between each pair of topics highly represented in that post. Um, it's basically the same as the previous measure, but the distance measure is completely different. It's based on co-occurrence, whereas for the previous measure, it's based on semantic similarity or difference. Okay. So there's good news and, and bad news in the results to this. The good news is these really do turn out to be measures of very different dimensions of diversity. The correlation is only 0.25. So I think it's a promising, it's a promising way of looking at these things. The bad news is they are completely unrelated to the probability of selection within this data set. Um, now they're they're kind of good reasons to imagine that they they might one might expect them not to be strongly related, that combinatorial diversity of any kind wouldn't necessarily play a major role in this kind of setting. For one thing, there's, there's a really interesting paper by um, Henning Piazunka and Linus Dollander, which uh, looks at a lot of different, a lot of different um, crowdsourcing things and, and finds that the greater the time pressure on the people doing the selection, the less tolerance there is for unorthodox ideas. They may orthodoxy quite differently than we do, but um, they do argue that time pressure leads people to, to hew to the familiar. And that may be going on here for, to some extent because the selectors were under a lot of time pressure. The other thing is that, you know, it may be that a jam of this kind in a large company is going to be more about exploitation than about exploration um, in March's terms. That the problem space is well understood. People have been talking about some of these issues for decades or at least years. Um, and the, the function of a jam may be to build consensus around new solutions rather than to redefine or, or reframe um, uh, problems in, in highly innovative ways. So it may be that some of that diversity that makes a difference is baked into the discussion before you get to the jam. It's highly speculative, of course. Okay, so what are the conclusions? Um, I'm rushing through a little bit because we lost lost time, but um, I'll, I'll slow down for a second. First is probably the most, you know, the most boring conclusion you'll see this year, which is that in a firm-centered broad mandate discussion, interventions are more effective if people care about the topics that they're addressing. Well, you know, that's obvious. But it means that analyses in this literature that don't take content into account are likely to misspecify causal dynamics. They're likely, for example, to attribute things that are the effects of content to the effects of the characteristics of individuals who, who tend to, to raise those issues. I think we also demonstrate that topic modeling is a useful way to summarize a huge amount of information in the wide ranging discussion of, of this kind. Um, even though the documents, the posts, are in some cases relatively short, we eliminated things that were under 10 words, but we kept everything else. Um, 
the topic modeling nonetheless had a lot of face validity and, and was quite useful. Um, third thing is that by looking at the topics around which there was consensus where participants and selectors converged, we got insight into the operational challenges that were facing the company. Um, and also if there had been divergence between managers and others, which there really wasn't in this data set, um, topic modeling would be a good way to find it, an efficient way to find it. Third thing that we found about this particular jam was that it was very highly structured by forums. A lot of intergroup consensus around topics within forums. And um, you can see the influence of the moderators in the significant effect of the lead alignment on selection on the fact that people followed their leads and the um, participants who followed their leads in terms of what subject matter they talked about were more likely to have their posts selected to illustrate important ideas. We see a lot of differentiation of themes between forums. They really were about other things. Studies of other jams of this kind has sometimes found that um, forum distinctions break down and are kind of hard to maintain, that people are like stray cats and go off in different directions. That wasn't the case at, at IBM. There's also some evidence that the forums were effective dialogic spaces, um, that posts that were informed by long threads were more likely to be selected. And if the thread was long enough, um, the, the uh, selection became independent of whether or not the post was aligned with the uh, emphases of elites, that there may have been an, an actual reframing of, of posts that were perceived to be of value. Obviously, a lot of limitations in the study. We don't have any idea about the people who didn't take part. We looked at consensus on what was important among participants, but it may be that the people who chose not to participate had a different view, and we can't know that. I think any study that uses uh, text from an online discussion faces the challenge that um, there's going to be a lot of conversation that's induced by the online discussion that um, operates at the local level that's face to face and, and isn't represented in the um, in the documents that are available to analyze. Um, it would be great to have people doing field work in the company at the same time that the um, that the jam is going on. Um, but of course, in a global company like IBM, there would be a limit to even that. So basically, that's a, a limitation to any research of this kind, I think. In our particular data set, we had bad data on occupation and location. Well, location wasn't bad, but very limited data on occupation. So what I would love to have been able to do would be to construct networks of people who, um, of the peers with whom each person worked and to be able to use that kind of peer network data based on fine grained information about location and job, not possible with the data that were available. And of course, we can't say anything about long term effects. So just a couple of, of, of points in conclusion. Um, you'll, you'll notice that I'm not trying to generalize from our findings about the IBM World Jam to uh, this kind of discussion in general, because I think the design really matters, that um, decisions made about how to design a jam will have a big effect on the kinds of things that matter for the results. Um, obviously, the, the IBM World Jam, like other discussions of this kind had a broad non-technical focus. And that meant that a lot of people could participate. There were a wide range of suggestions and, and experience in many cases had a bigger role than technical expertise in, in what people said. The fact that there weren't any prizes reduced competition and increased intrinsic motivation probably led to more comfortable collaboration. Um, the fact that it was very brief, that it was a 54 hour jam, there was another part of it that involved this, you know, uh, voting on the um, proposals that were identified by the communications team. But the fact that the discussion itself was only 54 hours um, made the jam a kind of liminal event. It created a sort of effervescence um, that one would associate with a rit ritual, a lot of excitement. But at the same time, of course, it meant that there wasn't a whole lot of continuity of exchange uh, because people were doing their jobs and they only had 54 hours to participate. And it also placed a lot of pressure on decision makers to, to come up with their uh, decisions and selections quickly. 
it was really important, I think, that everybody had to post using their name. Um, there was no anonymity. People were responsible for what they said. It was also important that in the previous jam, there hadn't been any intervention or reprisals against people who posted critical views. Uh, there was a kind of trust and an openness engendered by that policy of non-intervention, but at the same time, a degree of civility because people were accountable. They were going to be working in that organization and people knew what they had said, so they had to say it in a civil manner. Um, IBM had expert moderators who were diverse in terms of region and affiliation. Um, they they uh, purposely brought in people with different perspectives to single inclusiveness. Um, yet at the same time, these moderators provided pretty strong direction through their opening mandates. There were also other devices they could use to um, direct attention, not clear how effective the latter were, but certainly the, they set the, set the themes. A lot of endorsement by executives. Not all of these events are that well attended. There's not always that much participation, but um, there was strong signaling from the top that this was important, which was reinforced by the kind of ritual character of the event itself. And then finally, I think it was important that the people who did the selecting were different from the people who did the moderating. You had the, the actual operational people moderating the forums. The people who did the selection didn't have a, a dog in the race. They were able to be impartial with respect to the kinds of proposals they selected because their interest was in making the um, event perceived to be successful and not in favoring one or another definition of the situation or one or another um, uh, group within IBM's divisions or regional areas um, uh, preferences. So there, there was a, um, that, that was probably responsible for the absence of effects that one has seen in some other studies where, where executives have a much bigger role or people in some departments um, are more likely to have their proposals selected. Okay, so thank you for your attention. I apologize again for the interruption. And um, we'll stop sharing the screen and go back to the regular screen and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask a question? Who is who is moderating this? Uh, Paul, can you hear me? Oh, uh, is that is that Siggy? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, in order for me to get it into perspective, I would like to. Uh, uh, you to tell a little more about the dependent variable because, okay, so a post is selected and what is now the, the importance of being selected or not being selected for other things? So the, um, in terms of the career of the poster, Probably not a lot. I mean, it's a kind of positive recognition, but it's not a, a, a you know, it's not a career making one. Um, the the um, proposals that were developed out of the out of the recommendations and, you know, the ones that we saw were, were pretty consistent with the, the posts that we read um, were then voted on in another in a subsequent process by all of the people who had participated in the jam. And they, uh, I think, selected some smaller subset, each of which was investigated by a team and, and essentially given the opportunity to be developed into a project. And some of them were developed into projects. So the potential for the, the potential payoff for the exercise was the development of, of new policies or new innovations for the company some of which this was not a focus of our study, or at least not of the part that I was involved in, but um, some of which apparently did have an impact that were adopted. Um, but the, uh, 
but the posts themselves were essentially illustrative. So the question is, which posts did the evaluators find to be particularly worthy of attention? Okay, so either you or somebody else may actually follow up to see which ones develop into into projects and have what kind of consequences for the company. Yeah, this is more, I think, what Charles is doing. He's, he's doing more of a substantive study of the, the change process at IBM. Okay, okay thanks, Ron. Sure. So, um, Paul, would it be fair to summarize this as sort of a, a study of sort of deliberative democracy within a firm? Well, democracy, I mean, you know, I guess I'm too cynical to apply democracy to anything that goes on within a firm. Um, I think it probably, you know, probably stretches the limits of Habermasi and, you know, dialogue within a corporate setting. I mean, look, Anybody, you know, there's obviously if you have public statements, people are going to um, not say anything that they believe will be um, harmful to their careers if they intend to stay in the firm. Now, that was not true of the values jam. That was people really let it hang out. But but there was older employees, some of whom were close to retirement, who had been very frustrated for quite a long time. Um, in this one, the tone was more positive. Either the older employees had you know, there's probably a fair amount of selection out of the firm or adaptation to the new, the new way. Um, so, you know, obviously there's going to be a certain amount of self-censorship. Um, and that's why it would be great to be in the, in the local discussions that weren't online to hear what people were saying about the process. Um, by and large, though, by, by, I think, bureaucratic or organizational standards, um, there's evidence that the um, discussion was was relatively open and deliberative. For example, um, threads were fairly long compared, you know, the average, the modal thread length of pretty much every discussion I've ever looked at is one. And, and here, I think it was like 2.2. So it wasn't huge, but there were a fair amount of extended discussions. Um, the There was no very little favoritism towards executives and managers that didn't have a, a huge, um, huge role to play. So, um, yeah, so it, it was fair, it was quite deliberative and fairly democratic. The extent to which that was performative, I think was fairly high as well. Um, I mean, that's why I emphasize the, the, the extent to which I think these things are probably rituals that, that um, in a sense, enact the sense of the, the company as a community. And that's probably one of the reasons that they've become so popular. The fact that they also generate ideas and, and perhaps align collective opinion around issues that people are aware of but may not have articulated um, is probably important as well. I mean, clearly, the, the degree of attention that was paid to aligning incentives, that's one area where I think there probably was a payoff, the recognition that in order to move flexibly, flexibly, you had to have people rewarded for working with people in other parts of the company. And I think that that's something that probably wasn't that important back in the 70s and 80s, it was very important by the 2000s and, and the sort of underscored that and I believe led to change, although that's a more of an impression, that's not a you know, clear finding. Are you great? No, and if I can just follow up really quickly, um, how much is the, uh, do you think that this is sort of creating, trying to create community or trying to create policy? You know, if we think about these two sort of mm -hmm. goals of democracy, right? Yeah. So I think it, the first one in 2003 was clearly about creating community because the company had been through a lot. There were a lot of bad feelings. They had lost this sort of famous culture that they had without much to replace it. So the values jam, I think, was definitely about community. It was almost a therapeutic process. And the output of that was this new statement of company values. Um, this, I think, was a little bit of each. I mean, one of the things that, you know, is difficult about any kind of centralized change effort is, is that, I mean, you know, 
think about if you're if you're well, I'm sure it's not like this at Cornell, but many universities, if the dean or the president says, you know, this is our new mission going forward, people in the lab or people in the, the work group aren't going to be talking about that as and how great it is and how they want to contribute. They're going to be talking about how pissed off they were that they didn't get a budget line for a new technician or an RA or something like that. By kind of rewiring conversations and getting people to all focus on the same thing, if only for a period of time, um, I think these things actually do create more of a sense of, of community and create um, the potential for moving forward certain kinds of change initiatives, probably not creating them out of whole cloth. My guess is that very few of these generate ideas that nobody had ever thought of before. But that, so I think they can, they can do both, but community is a, a lot of it. Of course, they, you know, I mean, if a, if a situation is dire enough, if, if, if a company has been cutting jobs, is, is, looks like it's about to go out of business, you don't want to have one of these things because all of the talk in the world isn't going to change that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I think I see Michael's hand. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks, Paul, for, for a, um, a great talk. It's extremely interesting. Uh, I've also worked with uh, IBM Data. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that once, yeah. Uh, their social networks, uh, uh, social media platform. Uh, mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask, uh, so in addition to all the really important contentful findings uh, and conclusions from your study, there's a really interesting and important methodological contribution, or maybe it's an epistemological contribution, which is the distinction you make between similarity and co-occurrence. Mm -hmm. I think this is really important. Uh, I really mm -hmm. hope you'll follow up uh, on this. Um, we, or Victor and I are working on a paper with Surui Wang at uh, Penn, and we, we ran into this problem. Uh, we were using co-occurrence to measure similarity, and then we quickly realized, wait a minute, this is assuming that when something co-occurs that the person that was putting those things together was intending similarity. They might have been intending diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, they might have put them together because they're different, not because mm -hmm. So we, we, we got, you know, we, we were exactly the point that you raised here. So we went and hand coded the content mm -hmm. uh, to see if, if, if co-occurrence was really capturing similarity. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a strong positive correlation, but it wasn't 1.0, it was about 0.25. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Big or little. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we also found that the uh, extent of which co-occurrence and similarity lined up depended upon whether we use TF-IDF weighting. Mm -hmm. And- um, Yeah, uh, which we did. There, you did not. No, we did. We oh, did, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, we, I, we used something very similar to TF-IDF weighting that had the same effect, yeah. Uh -huh. And it might also depend upon whether the co-occurrences are occurring within the post or within the corpus of a poster. Uh, mm -hmm. so I would imagine that co-occurrence captures similarity better at the post level than it does at the poster level. Yes. Yeah. At yeah any rate, I that's I right. hope, uh, this is just a, a vote for hoping that you you will follow up of some further analyses on uh, on this problem of using co-occurrence to measure similarity. Long overdue for that to really be opened up to some careful inspection. Well, thank you, thank you, Michael. I, I've I'm excited about it. I mean, I wish that we had some findings in this paper, but you know, we're we've looked at some, we're beginning to look at some other stuff. But um, I'm glad you think it's worth doing. I'd love to see anything you've done, and if you're interested in collaborating at some point, I'd love to talk about that as well. Well, I can send. I'll send you uh, at least I'll send you our methods uh, section, or I'll send you the whole paper uh, if you want to read the whole paper. But we sure, where we. Where we did compare what happens when we when we hand code the content versus we just use we use cosine similarity, not your card, but mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Great. Thank you. I see um is, is it Solhan? Is that yeah. how you pronounce it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um first of all, thank you so much for the great talk. Um I I had a question about your um, findings about elite alignment. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was very interesting that you found out that the more moderators kick off or mention and selective more than the other um, posts. And I, I, my question is too. So first is 
uh, could you provide a uh, more context about like this jam so that like I, 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 I had hard time envisioning what kind of sharing and selecting pools more uh, look mm -hmm. like. And secondly, about like, uh, do you have any kind of ideas about why it will be the case? So like, would it be fair to kind of generalize that under the complexity and uncertainty of these uh, kind of mutual sharings and mutual kind of pools, uh, would it be fair to say generalize that under that condition, it's like uh, those people who are assigned um, with their position by the organizations, they have the ag agent capability for agenda setting uh, or like to set up like focal points so that other people can kind of use that um, for coordinations or, or communications, would, would that be like fair to fair kind of generalization? Yeah, I think that's exactly right, and it's a very good way to put it. The, uh, you asked for more description of how it worked. Now, one one thing I want to clarify is that it wasn't the moderators' posts that were highly selected; it was subsequent posts that reflected the same themes as the moderators' posts. And I think it did exactly what you say, which is that they provided. Uh, they provided focal points, they provided direction, um, and they got the conversation going. And they also um, no doubt reflected those preoccupations that were shared by many of the people who chose to participate in the forum as well. Um, so, you know, it, I, it, it may be, it, it, it's not, simply that the posts were aligned with, it's not the fact that they were aligned with the posts of elites that necessarily led to their selection in the sense of getting credit for being like the elites, but that they may have, um, that they, whatever process the, the moderator set off by choosing to focus on particular themes was reflected in the development of the discussion in a way that the post perceived as most valuable were those that echoed those themes. Paul? Yeah. Uh, the aspect of the uh, two meetings that you've studied have a town hall uh, uh, feeling to it to create a community of a, in a global corporation. Mm -hmm. And uh, the posting of um, topics uh, would suggest that it could lead to, in a town hall, knowledge sharing, uh, organizational innovations. Mm -hmm. uh, did that happen? And to what extent did that happen? Uh, making the organization better uh, in the way of knowledge sharing and re 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 revamping the organization. Yeah at the global scale. Yeah. So, so as, as, I, as I mentioned, that's not something we studied systematically. That's something that, that Charles is looking at, but that, that I haven't looked at systematically. So what, this is really a report on, um, on things that I've heard in the course of you know, chatting with people, which isn't exactly high level you know, qualitative research. Um, my impression is that some subset of the, you know, so they had maybe 20 or 30 working groups that um, attempted to develop these ideas that were chosen through this voting process as being of a particular interest. And um, my impression is that a subset of those led to programmatic change and a subset of those may have actually made a difference. <coughs> but it's very tricky to attribute causal, you know, make causal attributions to a process like this, because it, it best, the developments that came out of this were probably part of larger thinking and larger innovations that were, had been going on for some time, at least in terms of problem definition. So I, I, my impression is, yes, that this played a significant role in change, but it's not as if ideas came out of this that nobody had thought of and then they were developed into programs or, or products or whatever and, and very successful. Now, you know, some companies use this process to develop new products and there I think you do have examples where a product that hadn't been in 
operation, but it hadn't been in development before. It does get in development and sometimes they are successful. Um, when you're looking at proposals for dealing with, you know, kind of long-term problems like coordination across departments and, um, and um, the tension between um, control versus autonomy, you're not going to have a dramatically new big fix that comes out of a discussion of this kind, but it can move the needle. It can suggest smaller changes which can be adopted and so on. So I think that's more the kind of way in which a discussion like this figures into, into change. Right. Uh, in the pa the, one of the papers that Michael and I uh, have been working on uh, is on knowledge sharing and spillover uh, and rewiring outside of the firm. And mm -hmm. this focuses on New York City, just around the place where New York, uh, NYU is located and also Los Angeles. And I agree with you, it's hard to establish causality. Uh, however, it is clear to do so if you have a co-evolution of this knowledge spillover sharing uh, process embedded in network overlapping uh, yeah. and cross-cutting and uh, the same time uh, huge surge in the founding of technology firms a very mm -hmm. different, uh, right around midtown New York and uh, across uh, the uh, Los Angeles so the same processes occur and it's very very clear that the two are linked the sharing of knowledge and spillover and the uh, increasing diversity and founding rate of mm -hmm. uh, technology firms that thrive from innovative activity that gets, uh, that's built into knowledge sharing of this type. But so it may well be very useful to see a similar process within just one firm mm -hmm. that is spread out across the world. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a that's a, a good point, and it would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just add to to Victor's uh, question. Uh -huh. uh, if you uh, look at the focus of content, right, which was central to your uh, study, uh, couldn't it be that actually the very process was, um, or the focus on content? that reduced the importance of local identity uh, actually uh, led to not community in that sense, which could be a warm bath or a shared identity, but to a shared understanding of joint production, uh, of a shared understanding of different inputs of diversity leading to common uh, added value so that uh, it, it would be the opposite of community uh, it would break the importance of local identities and not just shape a, 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 a overarching IBM community but uh, but shape the the uh, realization of diverse inputs from all sorts of uh, places to a joint endeavor mm -hmm. and be a different function of the jam than the poster or the selection of the poster. So it would be the side effect may actually be the main effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I mean by rewiring communication networks that I think that really is critical. Um, I'm not sure I understand why that would be antithetical to producing community. I think what yeah. you describe as community in a Durkheimian sense of organic solidarity as opposed to mechanical solidarity, a recognition of, of a division of labor and, and okay. different. Okay. But very, very often com community in the organizational literature is, is more of the we feeling rather than the, uh, than the organic solidarity part where you have I the see. different inputs. Uh, okay, so so that's, that's yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I understand that. That makes sense. Yeah, Barum, I see you've had your your hand up. Oh yeah, uh, uh, 
my question is a little bit more tangential, but um, so I was like interested in, in deliberation. So I think it's like, you call it deliberation. In essence, it's just like thread length, how long the thread is. Mm -hmm. And um, like, uh, you know, I just wanted to ask you kind of like, what do you think about like what's going on in the thread? So you read these threads. So what's the dynamic and what kind of determines the thread length, for example? Mm -hmm. So is it more of a process where people like just reinforce each other that kind of creates longer threads or is it when people disagree or also, um, for example, when you have like multiple posts in a thread um, and you look into the topic distribution, so, so to say, do you see like an increase in the entropy or the variability or is it more that people really converge on a topic which yeah. makes kind of the meaning of the thread more clear? So just any kind of what you found or your impression of what is going on in these threads and especially mm -hmm. what keeps the conversation going, so to say. Um, yeah. So, well, we, so our other paper is about what keeps the conversation going. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but so we, we did look at entropy and we found there wasn't, there, there was less entropy than you might have than we might have expected. Um, and, um, but what, what there was is this, if you look at the, so I think, you know, some of the threads, there are many different kinds of interventions in the thread of, of discussion like this. Some of them are, gee, I agree with you, that's great. Others are, well, you have a good point, but, you know, and, and those were the ones which I think tended to lead to more productive discussions. And, um, it, you know, as, as, as you see, of the ones that were eventually selected, some of them stayed on, on course in terms of the themes that had been prominent in the discussion as a whole and elaborated on those. Other ones moved into other areas and brought different perspectives to bear on, on what had been being discussed. So, you know, it, it would take, I think, a more, a deeper kind of qualitative analysis to answer it in a more satisfactory way, but, but um, we didn't find strong patterns insofar as we looked of, of movement from one theme to a, another one. Um, tended to face, stay fairly focused, except in the cases of the longer themes that led to posts that were eventually selected that had diverged from the in, initial stimulus, if that makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Well, uh, if there are no other questions, thank you so much for a great seminar. And we hope next time we hear from you, we will have you visit the Ithaca campus. Uh, now that we have a New York City campus too, we <laughs> like to draw people to Ithaca. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you again for the talk. Well, thanks so much for, for having me and thank you for your comments and, and questions, which were great. I appreciate it. <laughs>